Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are gracious to us and merciful. And thank you that you've given us all these precious and magnificent promises that by them we have everything we need for a godly life here on earth. Lord, we need also the Holy Spirit. And so this morning we want to yield to your spirit and bring these truths home into our hearts, Lord, and let them bear fruit, we pray. We want to be those who hear and those who see those who receive your word implanted, that it may bear fruit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So as you've heard, we've uh, been in Melbourne at the camp and we've been uh, considering this subject of fanning, fanning the flame. And um, we, we heard there over and over how this is a message for you and I to fan the fa flame. And it's not something we, we should ask God to do for us, but God asks you and I to do it. And we have a personal responsibility. And I said also that more and more as I read God's Word, I realize that the Christian walk is a walk of cooperation between <coughs> man and God. And God does His part. He always promises to do His part but there are conditions to it and he requires of us our part to do our part and always when God promises to do something he says if you I will if you many times take note of that as you read God's Word that there is responsibility on, on our part and uh, that we ought to do what we can and he will do what only he can uh, so praise God for for that but let us think about perseverance this morning and it's a, an encouragement for myself first of all because I need it and uh, I hope that it will be for you as well because we all need it. In this day and age we live, there is a darkness that is surrounding us and seeks to overcome us. Let's not be, you know, uh, let's not be fooled. There is a battle, there is a war. A spiritual war and if we're not careful we will be overcome and we can see in the you know in history that many have been overcome by it and we don't want to be such people so may the Lord help us uh, to uh, see the importance of persevering and you know we we see that in uh, the gospel faith is central <coughs> Faith is necessary on our part. Uh, however, that faith is not just a one-time faith that I believed on such and such a date. At one moment of time I believed when I heard the gospel and then that's it. Faith was then. No, that's not the message we see in the Word of God. If that faith must continue. That faith must persevere. It must go on. We must go on believing until the end so that God can accomplish and bring about what he has promised. Uh, you know, we must go on believing and we must go pressing on until we reach that goal, until we reach the destination. And we looked at Paul's letter to Timothy in particular in 2 Timothy. And we see there Paul um, exhorting Timothy and, you know, if, if we just quickly think about who Timothy was, Timothy was a, a, a godly man that, as far as we can see, Paul praised Timothy for being a one af, after his heart and his, you know, working together, striving together in the same ministry with Paul. And, you know, this was a, a godly man who was, uh, you know, pressing on and serving the Lord and Yet, at the same time, we see that Paul finds it necessary to encourage Timothy not to give up. And he says in both letters when he writes to Timothy, he says, don't neglect uh, the gift that is within you. And he also says, fan the flame of this gift that was deposited in you. Um, or in other words, um, he says to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you. And then he, Paul goes on to mention uh, along those lines the fact that 
when he suffered for the gospel and he was imprisoned, he had other co-workers who had left him when that happened. Those who had turned back when things got tough. And then he goes on in chapter 2 to tell Timothy very strongly uh, and very clearly, you know, he says, uh, if we look at chapter 2, verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 2, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard from me and pr in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And no take note of verse 3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Suffer hardship. That's not a message we hear nowadays in the West accompanying the gospel. It's not something we hear commonly. And it's not something that our flesh wants to hear, is it, if we're honest? Suffer hardship? Do, did we uh, enter into this faith with this thought in mind that when I do, if I decide to follow Jesus, there's going to be hardship? Maybe we w might not have been so quick and eager to take it on if we had heard the message, the, the kind of gospel that Paul preached. And we see in uh, Acts also, Paul talks there about the fact that, you know, when, as Paul and Barnabas were going in, in from, from city to city and bringing the gospel, preaching the gospel to many, and many had believed and they, um, you know, made disciples in every place, uh, Paul found it necessary to go back to those places and to encourage them and to exhort them to press on in the faith. And in Acts 14, verses 21 and 22, I can read that for you. It says, After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, um, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith. He thought it necessary and the Holy Spirit led them to, to do this necessary thing of going back to strengthen the souls of the believers. It's not enough just a once off to share the gospel, but it's necessary to go back and encourage and exhort and strengthen the souls of those who believe. Why? Be you know, it, it's in all of us. We are weak and when we face trials and temptations and difficulties, uh, we are tempted to turn back and to give up on what we have started. And he continues to say, he, he, after he encouraged them to continue in the faith, he says, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Is that something we hear commonly today? Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And so that is a necessary part of the gospel, that it is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. And God does not promise us an easy road. He does not call us to walk on a bed of, uh, you know, roses or flower petals and make things easy for us. No, he promises us tribulation, just as Jesus said to the disciples in the world, you'll have what? An easy life? Money, pleasure, comfort, ease? Did Jesus pr promise that to the disciples? No, never. You'll have tribulation. But he says, take courage because I've overcome. And so that's the message of the gospel. The gospel is, yes, God promises us a new life and he promises us an eternal life, future together with him. And in that place, when we reach there, there will be no crying, no tears, no pain, no death. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And until we get there, there's tribulation and there's testing and there's difficulty. So let us be sober-minded Christians. And, you know, perseverance is something that maybe we, we don't appreciate. Um, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, the context there, Peter talks about these precious and magnificent promises that pro God has given us. Uh, and He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And God, through these, He has... He desires to impart to us His divine nature. And then Peter goes on to describe, and I think in the same 
in that same theme of partaking of God's nature, he outlines a, a few characteristics or attributes that we must add to our faith uh, in order to lay hold of this divine nature. And he goes on to say, you know, with all diligence, then add to your faith these characteristics. And he says, um, add to it moral excellence or virtue and add knowledge and add self-control and add perseverance and add brother, uh, godliness and brotherly kindness and love. And so these, partake to, uh, uh, these pertain to the godly nature, the divine nature. And, you know, I, I see, I, I ask myself, do I appreciate this attribute, this godly attribute of perseverance? And do I give attention to it? Do I ever bother to think, hey, I need to cultivate within myself perseverance? Just as we think maybe, you know, we ought to cultivate within ourselves love, right? We all know that. And I think we, we may uh, strive for that, you know, to love people, to love God, to love people as we love ourselves. What about perseverance? I don't think of it much. Uh, do I make it my aim to work in myself perseverance? And how should I do that? You know, we live in a world today in this Western uh, society, at least, where we have so many conveniences and so many things that, uh, you know, we can have to make our lives easier, to make things easier for ourselves and lessen our load. Uh, you know, and you, you can think of so many practical things you have in the home as well which are conveniences which the generations before us never had. Like running water, like refri refrigerators, like dishwashers and ovens. Can you think of how much time and effort these things save for us on a day-to-day -day basis? A lot of time and a lot of effort, yet the generations before us never had it. But they, they, you know, they had it tough. And I think natural, it was more natural for them to develop a persevering attitude in them and a perseverance as part of their character. They knew they had to work even to cook a meal for themselves. They had to start a fire. Even that was hard. And so many other things that they had to do. Drawing water, was they didn't have running water. They needed to go to a well to draw water from and bring it back. That was hard work. And so I think the generations before us, they knew what perseverance was and they uh, partook of this attribute called perseverance, uh, whether they liked it or not. However, in this day and age, it seems like an optional thing because we have so many conveniences, so many things to help us, to make things easier for us. And we neglect this thing which is so important for us. And unfortunately, it's not just for our daily uh, earthly lives but it's necessary for our spiritual lives. It's clear from the Word of God that we need perseverance. We need a faith that perseveres. And if you were to think of, you know, uh, you know you, once you, you think of a subject like this and you read the, the whole New Testament, uh, you can identify, you can, you can see so much of it uh, in, in terms of what Jesus spoke, and what, what the apostles spoke as well, what they wrote. And so, for example, just to remind you of Jesus' parable of the, the sower. Um, and I know we're familiar with it, very familiar with it. But just to bring out one thought. Can you tell me the difference between the rocky soil and the good soil which bore fruit? And what made the difference between one which did not bear fruit... And one which did bear fruit. The root. Yep. So it says about the rocky soil that it is a person who hears the gospel and with joy receives the gospel and believes. Right? But what happens? There's no firm root. There's no deep root there. And what happens when uh, tribulation comes and trial and difficulty, persecution, it says, Jesus says, they fall away. 
So there's no perseverance there. And what does it say about the good soil? The good soil is a man who receives the word of God in a good uh, heart um, and with perseverance bears fruit. So it's perseverance that makes the difference. It's not enough to receive the gospel with joy and to lay hold of it, you know, with all your heart. Uh, you then must persevere. And if you start well, you know, and you don't end well, what's, what good is that for, for us if we do not end well, if we don't finish? Uh, good starts, good beginnings are good, but we must press on until we finish well also. And what, is, what bridges the gap between these two things? Perseverance. And if we don't uh, value that, then we're going to give up somewhere along the way. And just as Paul was saying, some, when things got tough, when Paul was imprisoned, they gave up and they turned back. And therefore, he saw it so necessary to encourage Timothy. You know, when you see difficulty, when you see trials, when you see persecution... Uh, don't give up. Press on. Make up your mind to suffer hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's not something that comes naturally, but we intentionally, we decide it's a decision to press on in faith. And in life, we will have many temptations and many reasons to give up the faith. I'm sure we all do. And just to help us understand this word perseverance a little better. I looked it up in, in the original Greek because I wanted to see, you know, where is it used in the, in the New Testament and how is it used and in what context and things like that. And I saw that this Greek word can be translated in different ways, similar yet uh, distinct ways. And it's a Greek word which is hupomone, if I pronounce it rightly, but it can be translated in different ways, in different translations. We'll use different words in different parts. But it can be any one of these words. Perseverance, patience, endurance, and steadfastness. And if in looking at the definition for these words in, in our dictionary, modern dictionary, uh, it becomes very meaningful. And perseverance itself is... Persistence in doing something def despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. And I see this in the Word of God. I see that definition played out in the Word of God. And if I can remind you of one place where it's clearly told to us, uh, is, it is Hebrews chapter 11. What is that chapter about? It's about faith. But not only a once-off faith, a one-time faith. But it's a faith that perseveres to the end. And it tells us in the, at the end of that chapter of those who pressed on and believed God, even though they suffered and lost their lives and did not receive what was promised. Did not receive what was promised. Yet what did they do? Did they give up because things got tough? Did they give up because God didn't fulfill his promise in their, in, in their lifetime? They did not give up and they are for, for us now witnesses and testimonies and an encouragement that that is how our life ought to be also. And don't, don't you think we are given many opportunities to give up believing something that God has promised because there is a delay or there is difficulty that we must endure along the way? It's, it's God's way to, to test our perseverance. And if I can remind you of how he dealt with the people of Israel. After he brought them out of Egypt, what did he do? He led them through wilder the wilderness. And in De Deuteronomy chapter 8, it tells us a bit of insight about what God intended and what he wanted to do in, you know, when he brought them through the wilderness. You know, he didn't take them on a on a highway, on a road that was prepared for them with water stops along the way and food along the way prepared by God beforehand. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that God intentionally let them go without food, water sometimes. He let them go hungry. And why? Because he wanted to 
reveal what was in their hearts. He wanted to expose what was in the hearts of those people, whether they would obey him or not. And God, you know, unfortunately for the flesh, he uses the same means to test you and I also. He, he tests what kind of faith we have. What kind of faith is it in me? Is it the faith that believes when things are going well, but when persecution comes and difficulty comes, my faith disappears? Or is it a faith that perseveres no matter what comes my way? And which says, God, I believe in you. And no matter what happens, I'm going to still believe in you and still follow you and still serve you no matter what. What is our attitude then? Because God doesn't change his ways. His ways are good. His ways are perfect. So who needs to change? I need to change. I need to align my expectations with God's ways. And I need to change my attitude and how I walk and how I believe and, and, and everything needs to change in me. And as I said, the Christian walk, uh, you know, we, we're not deceived in any way. Uh, it's, it, the Bible tells us clearly that there's going to be difficulties and trials and temptations and opposition and pressure. And boy, do we face a lot of pressure these days to what? To conform to the world around us? to go with the flow of the culture that is around us and things like that, and to give up the fight of faith. Yet we are told clearly that there is a fight of faith. And Paul, again, is the one who tells Timothy, uh, fight the good fight of faith, <coughs> keeping faith, keeping faith. You've got to keep it. And Peter, again, in First Peter, you know, we read Second Peter chapter uh, one, but if we look back to the first letter of Peter in chapter one, he talks about our faith being tested by fire, being refined, just as gold gets refined in the fire and all the impurities get separated from that precious gold. It is the same with us also. And God uses trials to test and to refine our faith. And it's depending on it depends on us also in that time of trial, in that time of testing, the time of fire, how we respond. How we respond makes the difference in whether our faith gets refined and uh, becomes more precious to God or whether we give up the faith and we turn back. And because of difficulty, we, we start arguing with God, we start blaming God, we start questioning God. But a Christian is supposed to be someone who is firm, someone who is steadfast and unmoved. And God tells us, we are told in Hebrews chapter 12, that we are given a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us give thanks, therefore, because we are given a kingdom which cannot be shaken. And we too, being a part of that kingdom, we ought to be such people who cannot be shaken. Cannot be shaken by difficulties, by persecutions, by inconveniences. And I, I see, if I were to characterize, you know, in general, um, Christians of today, myself included, how I, I had this... this picture in my mind of a, a Christian in Western society today uh, of, uh, that resembles something more like jelly rather than a rock. And you know what jelly is like when it's on a plate and the plate shakes, what happens to the jelly? It shakes. The jelly shakes more than the plate. And that's what's happening in this, in this time, you know. God promises that he's going to shake all things. And if he's going to shake all things, he's going to shake all things. And he wants to see then who's the one who's going to shake and who's the one who's going to remain firm. And so we have to make it our goal and make it our intention purposely to uh, cultivate in ourselves a persevering faith that does not shake, 
when everything else is shaken. And God is going to help us. You know, Paul says to Timothy, be strong, not strong in your own strength and, you know, uh, roll up your sleeves and pull your socks up and come on, get on with it, be a man. No, he says, be strong in the grace of God. And we are told more than once that the grace of God is abundant for you and I. And so we are to be strong in the grace of God. But the decision, the choice is ours, whether we want to be strong or not, whether we're going to remain like that jelly or whether we are going to become more like a rock which cannot be shaken. And so, you know, I see because we have so many conveniences, these things make us soft. They are not evil in themselves, but the more we, we seek a life that is convenient and, you know, we seek a life that is, um, you know, easier for me, uh, the more soft I become, not only literally, but also spiritually. Yes. That's the, the sad part. You know, when you don't work, you sit at home all day or you have an office job like I do your body becomes soft. But when you are spiritually lazy and you don't exercise your faith when you are tested and you don't intentionally seek to serve the Lord even when it's inconvenient, I'm sorry to say, but you're going to become soft spiritually and you're going to end up like jelly on a plate. And I see that in myself. I'm not pointing fingers. But let us see the Word of God. Let us see God's ways. And let us seek by God's grace to become firm, steadfast. And those who are able to endure difficulty, inconvenience. And let me ask you a question I've asked myself already. Many of these conveniences we have in this day and age, as I said, they're not evil in themselves. But have I, have you ever denied yourself a convenience just because you could? Have you ever denied yourself a convenience for no other reason than you wanted to develop in yourself perseverance? I don't think I have intentionally. Uh, possibly in the past, sometime, you know, denied some inconvenience. But, you know, this, this world is such that it just presses in on us and pressures us into conforming to the way of the world. And, you know, we, we become soft spiritually, we become soft uh, physically. And we lay hold of any convenience that's available to us. But we can develop in ourselves perseverance by denying ourselves some small pleasure, some small inconvenience uh, to, you know, to, uh, so that we can become strong. And you know, what happens these days is that because we have so many conveniences, when things become inconvenient, like when it comes to serving God, most of the time serving the Lord is inconvenient. And it requires sacrifice. And it requires some effort on my part. And uh, the more I seek to have a life which is convenient, uh, the more I'm going to, uh, you know, my faith is going to diminish when God asks me to do something difficult. And so, you know, perseverance is so important. And Romans chapter 5 tells us that let us exalt in tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance brings proven character. Proven character does not come without perseverance. And James also says, Consider it joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. It's the same word. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be, become perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Endurance, perseverance, this thing in the middle, which, uh, you know, we start off, you know, with just faith. We have a faith in the gospel and in God. And we are like babies who depend on God to provide for everything. Um, 
But God wants to bring us to a place of maturity, of proven character, of having the image of Jesus Christ. And the, only, uh, the, the thing that brings us to that end, to that goal, is this thing in the middle called perseverance or endurance. And that is something on our part. And, it's, and so we see that it's an essential part of Christian character and Christian life. So the other thing is that God takes no pleasure in those who turn back. And in Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews, I think, is addressing this thing in the believers, the Jewish believers, of persevering when persecution comes and not turning back. And that's why we have this magnificent chapter 11 of Hebrews chapter 11, which is such an encouragement to press on and to persevere and not give up the fight. And, but in chapter 10, just before we receive that chapter of faith, uh, it's written there in verse 35. He says, you know, in previous, in former days after you were enlightened, you endured great conflict of sufferings. Uh, you were made a public spectacle. You were reproached. You had tribulations. Even your personal belongings were taken away from you. And you showed sympathy to the prisoners and those who were persecuted and imprisoned for, for the name of Jesus. Um, and you endured these things gladly, joyfully, it says. But now something's changed and the writer encourages them, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Then we read chapter 11. But there's a couple of verses then following that in verse 37. He says, yet a little while and he who comes will come and will not delay. But my righteous shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That's God speaking personally to you and I. If we shrink back when difficulty comes, when persecution comes, he takes no pleasure in us. <coughs> but we ought to be of those who do not shrink back, those who persevere, those who press on, those who have a faith to the preserving of the soul. So let's be encouraged. And Jesus says in Luke 9:62, <clears throat> no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is worthy to enter my kingdom. So let us not be those who lay hold, you know, take, on, take hold of the plow, work, be workers along with, with the Lord and be servants of God for his kingdom. Uh, let us not look back. Let us not turn back. But those who press on. Yeah, it's hard. It's difficult. But let us press on nonetheless so that we may endure to the end and receive the crown of glory that God gives to each one who has kept the faith, just like Paul says. And our fight today, the fight of faith that we have today is to keep on believing and to keep walking by faith in spite of our circumstances. And we do not walk by sight or by feelings or by every, every whim of the flesh. But we press on and we walk by faith in God in what he has promised. And we walk according to his commandments, though at times they seem difficult to bear. But we walk by these things and we, walk, we ought to walk by the light he has given us and not give in to the darkness that is around us. The so-called easy ways that are, you know, presented to us and offered to us by, by the devil. You see, Jesus says there's a narrow way and there's a broad way. Which one is easier? The broad way, of course. The narrow way is, is difficult. And we see this principle in the Word of God over and over. And I guess in every book of the Bible we see some message of pressing on of holding fast, of keep on believing, of keep on asking, keep on knocking. This is the message that, that we find over and over. And we see it a little more clearly in Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. 
What God has promised is this. He has reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. He promises to do that. He's going to finish what he started and he will present you and I blameless before him on that day. But don't stop there. Go to the next verse, which says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Amen. You see God's part? You see our part? If you continue, if you continue on in the faith and hold fast, be steadfast, don't be moved away. And in a short time, I, I want to uh, present to you Jesus' example. You know, Jesus is our forerunner and he endured the cross despising the shame for the joy set before him and he endured such hostility by sinners against himself and the reason is this so that you and i would look to his example and not lose heart yes. when things become tough yes. did jesus have to endure something when he was on earth did he yes. wasn't he rejected by many wasn't he uh despised wasn't he persecuted wasn't he beaten wasn't he falsely accused wasn't he abandoned by his disciples when things got tough do we face these sorts of things in life rejection abandonment pain suffering did jesus go through these things of course he did therefore he is our forerunner and look at Jesus himself telling us, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Jesus tells us, he gives us insight into even what he is feeling within. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known. We would have thought Jesus, he's special because he is God also. He, he, you know, things were easy for him in this life. It was easy for him to uh, deny himself every day, to do the Father's will, to go to the cross and to, to do all that for us. But Jesus says in John 12, verses 27 and 28, he says, now my soul has become troubled. Did he mean it? Yes, he did. Because he knew that he would go to the cross, the final expression of his uh, love and his sacrifice and his laying down his life for you and I. He knew what was coming. He knew there was more to it than, you know, just the pain of it. And he says, my soul is troubled. Do we become troubled in our soul in the trials of life? But what was Jesus' response? He said, what shall I say then? Because my tr soul is troubled. You know, you and I, we so easily give in to our feelings, our emotions, our, what our soul is feels in a particular moment or circumstance and we do what what we want to do we want to escape from a, a difficulty we want to escape when someone is troubling us what do we do instead of standing there loving them responding in gentleness we want to escape we want to run away from difficult situations difficult people difficult circumstances whether it's at work or wherever it might be in our home we face difficulties in our homes many run away because things are difficult but what did jesus say shall i say father save me from this hour he says but for this purpose i came you know to this hour so he says father glorify your name even if it means my soul is troubled my body is afflicted I go through pain, through suffering. He says, glorify your name. And he, he really struggled in the um, Garden of Gethsemane, didn't he? He didn't want to drink the cup, humanly speaking, because he was a man. He didn't want to drink it. We also have many things we don't want to take. We don't want to drink. But in the end, he said, I will drink it because it's the Father's will. Can we develop that same attitude? And so also we see Paul 
Paul who persevered, the, one of the greatest disciples of Jesus and apostles. And you think if anyone were to, was supposed to have a, an easy life because they had laid down their lives for, for the Lord, it should have been Paul at least. He should have been rich and wealthy and travel around in uh, his own personal jet, private jet, evangelizing the crowds and being, you know, the, the superstar and the healer and the miracle worker and the preacher of the gospel and living the high life. Shouldn't he have received honor for all his work for doing that for the Lord? What was his testimony, though? He says, I think God has exhibited us apostles as the, the worst, the dregs, the scum of the earth. And you look at the things he says of how he testifies of the trouble that he faced. To the Corinthians especially, he says in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5, just to point out one small verse there, he says, when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest but we were afflicted on every side. Conflicts from without and within. Fears within. <coughs> he was a man who faced trouble from without and from within. And in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 28, I'll, I won't read them, but he, he, he uh, outlines there a list of what an apostle of, the, uh, of, of Jesus Christ faces. What he, the apostle of Jesus Christ, who evangelized uh, m multiple nations and s uh, established churches and encouraged others. <clears throat> what, did, what happened to him? He was beaten. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked more than once. One time they, the Jews persecuted him and stoned him and they thought he was dead. They dragged him out of the city. And everyone thought he was dead, but he woke up, surprisingly. And what did he do? He walked back into the city. The next day he left for another city to preach the gospel there. And he continued on. He pressed on, no matter what pain he faced, what rejection, what opposition he faced. Even his own co-workers left him when he needed them most. That's what a servant of, of God um, ought to expect in this life. We, we should not expect honor and glory and praise, but we should expect to be treated the same way as even the greatest servants of God who lay down their lives for the Lord. And one, on one occasion when Paul and Silas uh, were captured and they were beaten and flogged and they were thrown into prison and they said, throw them, keep them secure, and they went into the, you know, the innermost dungeon, probably the smelliest and the darkest and the worst place that they could throw them into. What were they doing when they faced that situation? What would you and I do in that situation? Oh, we'd be crying out to God, but we wouldn't be crying out what they did. We'd be crying out, God, where are you? Why have you allowed this, you know, why have you given given me this, you have repaid me like this for all my hard work for you. What were Paul and Silas doing at midnight? They were praying and singing songs to the Lord. Boy, if that's not an example of perseverance, then nothing is. Perseverance means going against your every emotion and what comes natural to us. And living by faith says, I will not be uh, influenced and directed by my circumstances. Faith remains steadfast. If it is a true faith, it remains steadfast no matter where I find myself, what pain I have, what suffering I must endure. Yet we are so prone to uh, answering the call of our flesh and our emotions and to complain and to turn away when things get difficult because God has asked us to do something difficult and painful. But look at Paul's example. Look at Jesus and look at Paul. 
And look at his servants throughout the ages who were martyred, who were killed, who were tortured for Christ. And they could come out saying those were the best days of my life. That's perseverance. And one last thing, you know, failure is also something that can cause us to turn back. When we try to serve the Lord and yet we fail, we have good intentions and yet we make a fool of ourselves. What happens then when we are embarrassed and ashamed of ourselves? Aren't we tempted then? Doesn't the devil come and whisper, you're not meant for this. God, maybe God didn't call you to do this, to serve him. Just go and live your own life, live a quiet life, undisturbed by others. Do what you want to do, not what other, other people want you to do, not what God wants you to do. Yet look at the failures of Peter. He failed the Lord. He said, I'm not going to leave you, Lord. I'll go with you even to death. And when those, um, those soldiers came to, and those people came to take Jesus, what happened to Peter? Where was he? He fleed. And he was following from a distance. And when he was asked if he was a disciple of Jesus, what did he say? No, I don't know him. He failed and yet, after that, Jesus met with him and brought him back. And, you know, he, he accepted the call of Jesus to shepherd his sheep and to suffer for his name's sake. Jesus told him, you're going to suffer. This is what's going to happen with you. But Jesus, uh, Peter responded well. And he was willing to suffer. And so our failures need not keep us from keeping the faith. And pressing on and persevering to serve the Lord, to serve his kingdom. And to do his will. Paul also, he started off as a persecutor of the church. And he ended up. You know, he, he got the shock of his life on the road to Damascus when he realized that he was persecuting not heathen, not um, uh, deceivers or, or anything like that. He was deceiving the Lord whom he thought he was serving. And for three days he fasted and he prayed and he was blind. And I'm sure that was a, a time of self-examination for Paul of how he had failed the Lord yet you know God is merciful to our even in our failures and he calls us back he gives us chance after chance and opportunity after opportunity and he calls us to serve him and Paul got up and he became the zealous servant of God that he was uh, partly, I think, because of his failure when he saw himself as, as a persecutor of God. And he says, because of that reason, I am the least of the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But the, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me did not prove vain, and so, as a result of my great failure, when I saw who I was really in the sight of God, he says, I labored even more from that point on to make up for that in some way. But he says, it's not me who labored, it was the grace of God that was working in me. And so, you, too, you and I too need to have that same attitude and focus of Paul to be strong in the grace of God no matter the opposition, no matter the difficulties that we face, when God calls us to serve Him, when God calls us to serve His church, His people, to uh, love others, to bring the gospel to others, to disciple others, to encourage others, it's not going to be easy. But it's going to be worth it in the end. And Paul says there's a crown laid up for those who have endured to the end, who have kept the faith and who have loved the Lord's appearing. And so let me finish with what James says. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, 
which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Are we going to be those people? Can we decide to be such people? The choice is yours. The choice is mine. And then God will do the rest. He'll give us grace. He'll lead us through. He'll strengthen us when we need it. He'll encourage us. You know, just as Jesus, he was tempted and tried. And the angels came and, and fed him and strengthened him. At the right time, God is going to come through for us. But it's our responsibility not to give up. To press on, to hold fast, to be steadfast, to endure, even when there's difficulty and trial and, and, and persecution. So, let us press on. Let us persevere to the end. Amen.